Hello, I'm Michael Oslin, a historian here at the Hoover Institution, Stanford University. Welcome to our latest installment of Hoover Book Club, where we bring Hoover fellows and friends together to discuss their latest writings. Today, we are joined by Tosh Minohara, a professor of international relations and security studies at the Graduate School of Law and Politics at Kobe University, where he holds a joint appointment with the Graduate School of International Cooperation Studies. We will be discussing today the recently released Hoover Institution Press book, Japanese Americans on the Eve of the Pacific War, an untold history of the 1930s, authored by Eiichiro Azuma and Kaoru Ueda. Tosh, over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to uh, present this book uh, book today at this Hoover Book Club. Uh, let me jump right in. I have some slides to uh, that will go along with my talk today. So let me just share that with you all. Again, the book is uh, Japanese America on the Eve of the Pacific War and Untold History of the 1930s uh, by H. Azuma and Kaoru Ueda. Uh, I had the uh, the the honor to be able to be one of the contributors to this volume. Uh, so let me first uh, introduce the, the entire volume itself. Now, this book was written to honored uh, Professor Yasu Sakata, who is known as a trailblazer in Japanese immigrant studies. And he uh, is currently an emeritus of Osaka Gakuin University, uh, which is based in uh, the city of Osaka, Western Japan. Um, I'm actually uh, in Kobe, which is uh, the next uh, major city uh, west of Osaka. Uh, I know uh, Professor Sakata in the capacity as my external academic advisor uh, when I was writing my uh, master's thesis. This is between 1994 and 1996. Even though I was not a student at Osaka University, uh, because my uh, thesis examined the anti-Japanese movement in California, and its ramifications on U.S.-Japan relations, he was very kind uh, to take me on as uh, an informal student. And so I attended his class and, and was able to receive much uh, knowledge and insight. Uh, one of the <clears throat> main pillars of this volume is that it includes a translation of Professor Sakata's 1995 seminal uh, paper, which is entitled 50 Years After World War II and the Study of Japanese American History. This paper had, for a long time had only been accessible in Japanese uh, and this volume for the first time has made it available to the English language reader, which I think is perhaps the, the largest uh, contribution of this volumes. Uh, this this volume of course is a compiled volume. It has many contributors. Uh, most of those who have contributed a chapter have worked with Professor Sakata uh, and they clearly share his passion for archival-based empirical research. Uh, this happens to be also the approach taken by my mentor, Professor Yokibe, who, who knew Sakata, who actually uh, uh, really welcomed the fact that I was also getting the insight of Professor Sakata. Uh, and Professor Yokibe is known as a preeminent expert on U.S.-Japan occupation policy Japan, in other words, U.S.-Japan relations, and that's exactly uh, what my contribution is to this volume. Now, Professor Yokiba's relation with the Hoover Institution would be is that his first research was on Colonel Ishiwara Kanji of the Japanese Imperial Army. And this was, of course, uh, the, one of the topics of the late Dr. Mark Petey at the Hoover Institution. And I also had the good fortune to meet Dr. Petey uh, at the Hoover Institution. And we we discussed Ishiwara Kanji and, and whatnot. What makes Professor Sakata unique as a scholar of Japanese immigrant studies? It's the fact that he had the courage to tackle the 1930s. In the 1930s, it is a period that most Japanese immigrant scholars avoided because it is the time when U.S.-Japan relations sour, eventually leads to war, which had a tremendous impact on Japanese Americans. Uh, and as such, uh, to, to honor the courage of Professor Sakata, this volume also places its primary focus on the so-called uh, Dark Valley of the 1930s, uh, and its examination of Japanese Americans in both California and Hawaii. And of course, there's a vast difference between Japanese immigrants in these two uh, uh, California state, Hawaii territory back then, uh, because uh, Californians, uh, Japanese, uh, those of Japanese ancestry in California were uh, interned, were in Hawaii. Uh, I mean, internment took place, but it was on a very, very 
a different scale and it wasn't entire families being interned. So there is a difference. And I think this difference really comes out in this volume. Now, from now on, I'd like to focus on my contribution, which is chapter nine, which definitely is an oddball uh, in this volume because it does not directly deal with Japanese Americans, uh, nor does it examine the 1930s. Rather, it, it examines uh, the moment that Japan decides to go to war uh, against the United States. And then why, why is this relevant? Well, it's because um, the Japan's decisions to go to war uh, against the United States made Japanese Americans, uh, and you know, an, an enemy alien uh, for some, but some somewhere American citizens, but nevertheless, uh, citizens of of, of a country when which their home country was an enemy state and this really really uh challenged uh identity challenged elite allegiances uh and therefore it does have a tremendous impact on the story of japanese americans uh another focus uh or another uh, objective that this chapter had is to sort of figure out where the point of no return was uh and this long and winding road uh to the pacific war uh, <clears throat> Sakata was very special in that he uh, he realized that a, a new there, there was an official Japanese American narrative which was pretty much along the lines that a, a, a model citizen but Sakata realized that Japanese Americans were very diverse those there were those who were very devoted to the United States but there are also those who question the United States, especially because, you know, uh, they were forcibly relocated. Uh, and Sakata did not shy away from questioning the legitimacy of this longstanding uh, model minority a narrative. And one of the things that, that I like to bring forth uh, to sort of prove that Sakata was correct is that there, there was a school known as Heishkan uh, founded by the Gaima Show. And this was established in... Uh, 1940, I believe. Uh, and this was a school for Japanese Americans. Japanese Americans were selected. It was very uh, competitive, uh, but through various Japanese American communities in the United States, uh, once they passed exams, they were able to uh, receive a full scholarship to study at Ishikan in Tokyo. And many of these were unable to return uh, to the United States uh, once war commenced. And so they remained in Japan as Japanese Americans. So you can see that there's a whole range of stories, uh, and it's not just one narrative. Now, my research, like Sakata, uh, is, is empirical based. Uh, it's multi archival. Uh, I use sources in the United States, Japan, UK, Australia, and Canada. And again, this goes really uh, along the line of the historical research approach that uh, Professor Sakata uh, took. And my chapter also challenges the long-standing assumptions, like Sakata, and posits a new interpretation as to what happened by incorporating the dimension of intelligence. And I think this is what's really new. And by incorporating this new element, uh, this chapter uh, tries to provide a more logical reason as to why Japan ultimately decided to go to war. And on surface, it's very logical because Japan its GDP is about one-tenth the United States. It was totally, utterly dependent on the United States for many strategic uh, resources, including not only oil, but also steel and heavy machinery and whatnot. So why uh, this country that's much smaller uh, challenging the United States? And, and I tried to give a reason why this happened. Another larger premise this chapter has is the belief that history has utility. Uh, thus, the lesson that history provides needs to be learned uh, so that we can avoid some of the pitfalls in the future. And it's my belief that history is a beacon that casts a light, however faint, into the future. And this is what uh, Dr. Graham Allison calls applied history. And I think uh, this chapter is definitely a case study of applied history. Now, I'm going to jump right in. Uh, so every time you do empirical-based research, you need the evidence. Uh, if you're a paleontologist, it would be the dinosaur bones, and these are the bones itself. This is what launched my research. It was that I discovered, I stumbled across documents that showed 
that the Japanese were actually reading U.S. State Department cables. And this was something that was not known uh, until I had was able to discover these documents. And this is, again, it says in the Japanese on the right uh, with the uh, with the calligraphy, it says national, it's the highest level of national security. And this is a uh, the Japanese decrypt of a conversation between uh, uh, that was sent from Secretary of State uh, Hull to the American ambassador in Chongqing. And this it, and it discusses the Kudasu Hull conversation. And when you see this, you're like, wow. So the Japanese knew a lot more than uh, that they actually you know, let people know about. And this is another decrypt. Uh, I chose this one. There are about 100, and, I would say, 50 pages of these actual decrypts. Uh, I chose this one because it has a stamp of the foreign minister, the deputy minister, and head of the uh, America uh, section. Uh, as you can see, it's a very small, it was, you know, distributed in a very small circle, just like the American magic intercepts. Uh, so we have to keep in mind that the, it was well known that the Americans were reading Japanese decrypts. What was not known was that the Japanese were also doing the same. So both sides were reading each other's uh, highly sensitive diplomatic uh, cables. So this discusses, again, from uh, Secretary of State Hull to Ambassador Grew in Tokyo. Uh, and this discusses the FDR memorandum on the US, ongoing U.S.-Japan negotiations. And the U.S.-Japan negotiations was, of course, the final negotiations to avert war. This one's interesting. Uh, this is because it's in English. And both the, uh, the Navy and the Army and the Foreign Ministry, which is known as Gaima Show, all pulled their resources to, to decrypt American cables. Uh, the the army translated uh, these American uh, decrypts into Japanese. So that was the, the previous cables that I showed you, the decrypts that I showed you. This one, uh, the Navy and the Gaima Show did not uh, translate it into Japanese because they, 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 they could understand English at that level. They had the proficiency. Uh, but they added a summary. And this is interesting because it has a summary right here, which you do not see in the actual cable that was sent out. Now I've actually corroborated the actual cable in Japanese decrypts. Uh, they are there are certain areas in which the Japanese are not able to uh, decrypt, but they have an estimated guess in in, in brackets, and uh, you can understand by that the Japanese almost one hundred percent. You know the 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 accuracy was almost one hundred percent. Because even if you do not know a few words in a sentence, you can pretty much figure out what word comes in. And this, again, is the decrypt of uh, the Toyota Crady conversations sent from Gru to Hull. So, of course, the Japanese are participants to the conversation itself, but through the decrypts, they can figure out what the Americans are thinking, what they are assessing, and what their next step will be. Again, this is, uh, in Toyota was, of course, the... Uh, <clears throat> He was a Navy Admiral, but also a foreign minister during this time. Now, my main uh, protagonist in this chapter that I write is a person by the name of Togo Shigenori. Uh, and he was a foreign minister. And uh, people make history and history makes people. That That's something that my mentor, uh, the late Professor Yokibe, uh, used to say. And, and I do... I do uh, honor uh, this view and because I focus on foreign minister, a person who was in, in a very important position at a very critical time. But when you look into Togo Shigenori, his biography, it's very interesting. And so today I'd like to spend a little bit of time to just to sort of uh, explain to you who this person was. Well, you know, he was born in December 1888. Uh, this, his father was born in December 1882, died in July 1940. Uh, and this was Togo Shigenori's father. Uh, his father's name was Togo Jukatsu, and he was a skilled potter, uh, which is a, a key, key thing to know because uh, most skilled potters from this part of Japan, this is Kyushu, uh, were originally uh, brought to Japan from Korea. Now, the Togo family uh, for uh, centuries, uh, or at least 
a good uh, 400 years, you know, uh, were lived in the Kagoshima prefecture, which is the westernmost prefecture uh, in the Japanese four uh, islands. So it's Kyushu is the westernmost major island, and Kagoshima will be on the very southern tip of this island. He was an ethnic Korean. So you have an ethnic Korean who was foreign minister on the eve of Pearl Harbor, which I think is, is quite fascinating. Uh, there were 360 Koreans uh, in his village. Now, you may think, you know, this guy was in, in Japan for a very long time. So he's ethnic Korean, but perhaps, you know, it doesn't really matter that much. But the fact is, is that until uh, the Meiji period, this family was not allowed to mingle with other Japanese. And so the, the culture remained, the language remained. And this was because uh, during the, uh, you know, the Japanese feudal period and also during the uh, Edo period, that the, the lords of the domain were afraid that their uh, knowledge of making pottery, which was highly valued, would leak. So therefore, they were isolated intentionally in order to protect uh, the skills that they had. So uh, Togo himself, his last name was Park uh, for a long time, uh, since until he was four. So he does, really does have this uh, identity as being a Korean Japanese. He enters the Faculty of Letters at Tokyo Imperial University, which shows you in Japan, and this is true for uh, even the military too back then, is that regardless of your background, if you are able to pass the exams, you know, you were treated equally. And there is a very equitable system, a uh, merit-based system. And uh, Togo uh, studies German literature. So he's a little bit different than his other Gaimisho peers is that he doesn't go to the faculty of law. And he also uh, majors in German literature. Uh, he graduates in 1980, 1908, passes the Foreign Service, Foreign Service exam, which is very competitive. Uh, and so it takes takes him three times to pass. Um, many of his peers pass it on on the first go. So you know, you know, wasn't like he was a bright guy, but you know, a little bit different than his other uh, more well known peers uh, in the foreign service. Now his batchmate is is the famous uh, Amo Eiji, who is known for his Declaration 1934 of the so called Asian Monroe Doctrine. <clears throat> Uh, Togo is very interesting in that he's very international. Uh, he marries a German Jewish uh, uh, woman named of Eddie de la Lalande, who is a widow of a famous German architect. Now, the uh, late husband uh, has many buildings still remaining in Japan. One has to one happens to be in Kobe. It's known as the the Weathercock House, uh, a, a Western uh, style building in the so-called foreign settlement in Kobe. So it's, it's kind of interesting to see how uh, something that indirectly relates to my research also has, uh, is still physically remains in Kobe. He is uh, appointed to ambassador to Germany in 1937, but is recalled from his position when he repeatedly clashes with uh, Ford Minister Ribbentrop over uh, Nazi policy towards the Jews. Uh, his wife is Jewish. Uh, and, and he, he feels that it's in, completely wrong because he, uh, he's, of course, Korean Japanese, but he's never been treated, in, you know, uh, in, in a bad way. So he just really questions his policy. Uh, he's recalled, and then next he's appointed to the ambassador to the Soviet Union in 1938. Uh, but he is forced to resign when the hardliner uh, Matsuoka Yosuke uh, enters the Kuna cabinet as foreign minister. So. What's clear is that Togo is not a hardliner. He is not, you know, a, a, you know, a hawk uh, among the Japanese diplomats. And therefore, uh, when things, the situation between uh, the United States becomes very tense, he is very reluctant to enter uh, that cabinet. And this cabinet is Tojo. Uh, it was led by Tojo, who is a army general. Because he thinks that, that this cabinet is too warlike. Tojo had always been a hardliner. But he is persuaded by the senior statesman, Makino Nobuaki, to join the cabinet, saying that you are uh, the correct consul of Japan. You are the only person who can play a pivotal role 
in preventing war. And you can do that by entering this cabinet despite your disdain for General Tojo. Uh, and Tojo is Prime Minister, Interior Minister, he has several portfolios. Um, now, it's interesting because uh, Tojo, he just, even though he was a hardliner, he was chosen to become Prime Minister. And of course, the Japanese Emperor was behind this because they thought they can control him by making Prime Minister because he will have to serve loyally to the Emperor. And Tojo does change. This is called the so-called Tojo of Old Foss. From a hardliner, he becomes somebody who's willing to, to seek a diplomatic a solution uh, to, to resolve the situation with the United States. But then you have Togo, who, as you will uh, later uh, know in my talk, he reverts the other way. So you have a Tojo vote false and a Togo vote false. Now, Togo is a determined realist. And, and to show how uh, far he was willing to go to avoid war is the fact that he leaks the details of the September 6th Imperial Conference. This is the, the, the most highest level conference that you have in the Japanese uh, government, and it's done in the presence of the emperor. And the September 6th Imperial Conference is quite uh, special in, the, in that usually the emperor just sits and does not comment, but on this day, he comments. He, he he recites a poem saying that that he wants to avoid war with the United States, you know, that he wants to have calm seas. Togo divulges the content of this imperial conference to Ambassador Gu, saying that, you know, uh, even the emperor himself is against this war. Yeah, but, you know, there are still some hardliners left, but uh, please, con you know, please convey to your government that that, you know, it's not a monolithic block. Now, not everybody wants war. Now, um, I, uh, I've i been to the Togo Shigenori archives just to show you some photographs. This is a young uh, diplomat Togo. On your left in the center is his is, is German wife. Uh, on the right-hand side uh, is, well, on the top is the archive itself. And below is the main gate. So this is where Togo's resident used to be. You can see that as a wonderful uh, gate. It shows you that as, you know, he became very wealthy. And the, below you see some of his writing, uh, his handwriting. Now, I earlier said that Togo entered the Tojo cabinet reluctantly, uh, you know, very grudgingly. And uh, he sets forth three conditions that Prime Minister Tojo needed to accept. One was that a diplomatic solution must be of utmost priority for the new government, and he will resign if peace cannot be attained. He also insists that the Navy minister must not be a hawk. What happened is you have Adm uh, Admiral Shimada Shigetaro, who is on the far right, on the top of here. Uh, this, so you have a photo of Togo, and then you have a photo of Tojo, and then you have Admiral Shimada. He is appointed. Now, Shimada is, is basically a yes man to... Uh, Tojo, perhaps the most pro-Tojo person you'll find in the Navy, which generally disdain the army. Uh, but uh, Shimada Shigetaro was definitely not a hawk. Uh, he was, back in the day, uh, called a saloon door, meaning that a saloon door goes opens both outwards and inwards, that you know, he was pretty much would sway in the wind. Uh, so not really a person of principle, but he was not a hardliner. And Togo insists that he also must be given a free hand in reforming the Gaim show. What he does is he pretty much cleans house when he becomes foreign minister. He purges the so-called pro-Axis renovations. These are the pro-German uh, fascist-leaning diplomats. Uh, he really uh, was heavy-handed in the way he relieves these people. And, you know, the Japanese bureaucratic system, it's very difficult to, to fire people, but he finds a way. And it really shows you that he's intent on in seeking peace uh, with the United States. And his card to use to, 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 to solve or to resolve the situation in the United States is two peace plans. One is called Plan A in English. It's called known as Koan in Japanese. And it pretty much, since the main point of contention between the United States and Japan back at the time is Japan's war 
uh, with China and Japan making inroads uh, deeper into China. So he proposes that Japan will withdraw from China. And please keep in mind that China does not include Manchuria. At this time, Manchuria was not considered to be part of China, and therefore we have the Great Wall that it, that marks the border, the, the boundary between China proper and, 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 and the north of that. Akoa initially, uh, uh, Togo insists that Japan, the Japanese army will withdraw from China in five years. The army says, no, 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 it has to be 99 years. Uh, Togo raises his hand in disbelief, saying, what you, what you, I can't bring this to the Americans. I'm not going to say 99 years. Uh, so he says, how about 15? And the army uh, says, okay, how about 50 years? Again, not very workable. In the end, uh, they reach uh, 25 years. Uh, but Togo realizes the Americans are not going to say yes to Japan withdrawing in you know, 20, 25 years. So his next uh, plan is Plan B, which is uh, it's a, it's a lot more uh, it was considered to be a lot more feasible in that it's much smaller in scale it, and it's basically maintaining the status quo that Japan will not make any further inroads into China uh, and the United States will at this, at this time the United States embargo in Japan that it will allow uh, the uh, export of oil to Japan. So it was just sort of uh, lessening tensions uh, and so that you know, they can launch into another set of negotiation that can uh, reach a, a permanent uh, resolution to the crisis. I'll talk about Otsuan later on because this is very key to my chapter. Now, Otsuan is rejected by Tojo saying, no, no, I can't do this. You know, there are, again, lots of other hardliners in the Imperial Japanese Army. But this is where Togo uses his ultimate card. He threatens to resign. You know, and Tojo's like, oh, oh, this is this is this you can't proceed without a foreign minister. Uh so Togo's Tojo is okay, he's like, okay, I need to I'll reconsider my position. And of course, uh Togo, people, those that are close to Togo believe that this is not the moment to resign. So both uh, Makino and uh Yoshida, who Yoshida Shigeru, who later becomes a uh, prime minister in the post-war period, say, no, no, Togo, this is not it. You can threaten to resign, but don't resign. You gotta, that's your ultimate card. We'll have to use that at the moment in which peace is completely lost. Uh, because you can't go to war without your foreign minister. <clears throat> and so plan B is submitted as the most viable compromise uh, to be submitted to the American government. Now, what is this? Well, I told you what the plan, plan B is, and uh, but at the same time, the United States had so-called uh, the four, whole four principles, and the whole whole is uh, again uh, Secretary of State Cordell Holt, uh, and an American foreign policy can at times be very principled, and the principles that were raised at this time towards Japan were the four things that I write here: a respect to territorial integrity of China, non-interference in internal, internal affairs of China, maintaining an open door in China. And maintaining the status quo, right, which is, uh, you know, it actually goes back to, to John Hay and his open door notes. Um, but these were the principles uh, in the United States. Uh, definitely, uh, they were willing to negotiate because a war was already taking place in Europe because uh, Nazi Germany invaded Poland in uh, 1939. Uh, and so a war was engulfing much of Europe. So it did not make sense to open a second front. Of course, the British and Australians applied pressure to the Americans because they didn't want Japan to open up another front. Uh, the th fear was that Japan would go ahead and take all the British possessions in uh, in Asia and would also uh, advance south and, and try to invade Australia. So they wanted to uh, appease Japan uh, in, because they could deal with Japan after they deal with Germany. And this led to the creation of so-called the modus, modus vivendi, which in the Japanese is in the, in the characters there, zante kyotian, which basically means, you know, to just, just, just let's hold things for a little bit, which means that it was very close to the Japanese Otsuman maintaining the status quo. But it's important to note that both sides did not know that they were trying to create a, 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 a a short-term uh, resolution uh, to make it a status quo. So this most vendi was created independently of Japan's plan B it is, is a key thing to know. 
this is where the so-called Togo's Gold Foss takes place. And it was very unfortunate, uh, I think, uh, in, in Japanese history, uh, because again, this he was supposed to be the, the immovable dam uh, in Japan's path to war, that he was gonna stand in the way and not allow Japan to go to war. But yet in the end, Togo supports the war. And this has been a mystery in Japanese history for a long time which uh, I hope uh, my chapter uh, was able to explain why Togo took the action that he did. Uh, November 22nd, 1941, a very important uh, meeting takes place between the Dutch, Australian, British ambassadors and the Chinese minister. They meet in Hull's office. And this is the first time that uh, Cordell Hull reveals the contents of the modus vivendi. And this goes very much in line with America's Germany first policy, that is that they will deal with Germany first. But the Chinese, and, and so the Dutch, Australian, British ambassadors are quite content. Okay, it's it's Germany first, and we're not, we're not gonna force Japan's hand. But the Chinese minister, who she is infuriated because he thinks it's basically a selling out of China, that you're going to, you know, by focusing on Germany, you are ignoring uh, China's uh, situation. Hull says, okay, I understand you're upset, but please send this decrypt back to your home government, to Chiang Kai-shek. And the Dutch ambassador, you know, Dutch Australian and British ambassadors also do the same because they need to get the approval of their home governments. Togo learns of the content of the most of Indy through the Japanese decrypts. And I already showed you that the Japanese were able to, to, to read American cables. I believe that he read the uh, Chongqing, uh, the one that was sent to Chongqing, because the Chinese cables were the most easiest to read because uh, they didn't use cipher; they just used basically codes. They they used they used numbers to to represent Chinese characters, and this was because they couldn't Romanize Chinese back then because it was pronounced differently. And China's huge; they had different pronunciations for the same Chinese character. And so the only way they could communicate was through writing in the Chinese character. So it took about three to four hours, which was much shorter than you know uh, the other uh, English language decrypts, which took a couple of days. Togo's naturally elated. I mean, just put yourself in his shoes. I mean, he was thinking of this, and he submitted his plan B. He sees this most vendi, and he thinks, oh, the Americans are countering his most vendi, and it was very close. So he believes that the crisis can be averted. But what happens is on November 26th, the American final uh, response to Japan's plan B is submitted. And this is known in history as the whole note. Togo is stunned. And you can tell because he writes it in memoirs that I was utterly blinded by disbelief. And again, you know, it, it, the fact that he writes that hints that he was expecting something altogether different. And he's shocked because the whole note, there's no modus vivendi in the whole note. It's basically back to the same four principles. Uh, and so the United States had pretty much rejected uh, Japan's plan B. This is where you know, there's conjecture. I believe that Togo, seeing the decrypts of the modus vivendi, uh, felt that this would be submitted to him uh, as a counter his plan B. So in that an impact in that the situation could be resolved. But the moment the Americans dropped the most of Bendy, he realized he felt that America had decided to go to war. And Togo is a realist. He's not a dove. He's not a pacifist. And so he believes that if the United States has decided on war, that Japan had no choice but to go to war as well. And this is where he writes in his memoirs. Japan now had no choice but to rise. And this is immediately this is his impression right after reading the so-called uh, hold note. The moment Foreign Minister Togo gives us one diplomacy is when I believe Japan crosses the Rubicon. It's the so-called point of no return. So it's not the Manchurian incident. It's not the second Southern Japanese war. It's not the tripartite pact. I believe this was the ultimate moment in which Japan could no longer return, that the wheels, uh, you know, it started to spin 
on a course in which Japan would collide with the United States. So, you know, what are uh, the lessons uh, that can be learned? And this, I think, is really important if you are practicing so-called applied history. And I like to, I like Mark Twain a lot, and one of the things that uh, that he wrote, and I thought is definitely true, is is the quote there that you see uh, in front of you: "What gets you in trouble is what you think you know, but it ain't so." And that's exactly what happened in, in Toga's case. Um, it's very hard to uh, interpret the actual intent uh, of of your um, opponent uh, just through decrypts. You know, you have to, you know, and, and sometimes it can be very misleading because it's not intended to be read by a third party. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, this, this, I think this episode, very unfortunate episode, shows you the so-called fog of diplomacy, that limited information and the misconstruing of intent uh, can cause problems. That deduction is at times imperfect. And in this case, the results were disastrous uh, because... He was the last impediment to Japan's path to war. Once he gave up and decided Japan had to rise now, then there was nothing, there's nothing stopping Japan. Uh, caution is warranted when interpreting information that is intended to be read by third parties. So, and this is true with the Togo Nomura cables. Uh, Nomura was Japan's ambassador to Washington. Togo is sending all these cables saying, you know, Nomura is a former, uh, not only is a former, uh, not only is an admiral, he was a former foreign minister. Uh, so Togo has to send out or instructions to uh, someone who is much more senior than he is. But Nomura has a tendency, to, because he wants to avert war too, to sort of put put in his personal uh, views into official correspondence with the United States. And Togo does not want Nomura to add anything to plan B, you know, whether it be in writing or or or, or, or verbally. And so he says, this is Japan's uh, absolutely final like proposal. Plan B. Even though this was just telling Nomura, don't mess with plan B. But the United States, I've actually seen American decrypts to that, and that's underlined by somebody in the State Department. You know, that's a double underline. And, and yeah, this final, final like... Uh, absolutely final like proposal, uh, it was obviously construed to be in, in ultimatum. So I think this sort of explains why the Americans decided to drop the Mos Vendi, because they thought, well, Mos Vendi is very close to plan B, but it's not an exact match. Uh, but if the Japanese are saying, we're not going to budge on plan B, this is it, then why show the Mos Vendi? It'll just show the world that the Americans are willing to sell out China at a critical juncture. So it, without nothing to gain. And if you're going to gain peace by that, then of course it's worth it. But, and so I think, you know, again, it shows you the dangers of trying to read uh, the intent through these decrypts. And uh, I also think that it shows that wishful thinking is human nature. Uh, I think expectations cloud our judgment. Um, Togo really wanted peace. And I think that clouded his judgment. Uh, and another way to put it is we tend to see what we want to see. So he read into the decrypts what he wants to see. And this, of course, is known uh, uh, by psychologists as snare fulfillment. I'm not going to get into the details, but uh, when the American warship uh, downed the Iranian Air Flight 655, it's considered to be a classic example of snare fulfillment. Uh, so in other words, the crisis situation of November, November 1941 and Togo's eagerness to avoid war created a pitfall that led to a tremendous intelligence failure on part of Japan. And it's much more grave for Japan because the United States you know, also suffered heavily in the Pacific War, but Japan lost the war and it, it, it ended uh, a regime. So, I mean, the consequences are, were very, very grave. And this is my final slide. Um, one of the things that I believe my chapter reveals is, you know, uh, the intricacies of what was going on in the Japanese government by that, that during this time. Well, one of the questions is that I that I uh, it was all on my mind as I wrote this chapter is who's the adversary? That you know you have competing institutions. Even in the United States, you had competing institutions, but in Japan's case, you didn't have a strong central authority like the president. You know, the prime minister was not as pre and he couldn't control the navy and whatnot. So 
you had many competing institutions and they all were pursuing their own interests. And they thought it was national interest, but you know, other institutions thought otherwise. For example, uh, I, have, I have two examples here. One is the so-called Miyazaki operation that was launched by the Guy Michel. Guy Michel wanted to end the war in China. They sent a well-known Asianist to go to China, meet the Chinese, to sort of find a, a solution to the China, uh, the second Chinese-Japanese uh, war. Well, what happens is that when the moment Miyazaki lands on the continent, the Asian continent, he's captured by the Japanese Imperial Army because the Japanese Imperial Army were reading Guy Michel cables. And so here, again, you have, you know, your own team sort of obstructing what you're trying to do. It shows you the complexity of what was going on in Japan in 1941. And also you have the Konoe Roosevelt Summit, in which, you know, this was a last-ditch effort by Prime Minister Konoe to meet FDR, a summit that, that was to take place in Juneau, Alaska. Uh, but again, um, this falls through. Um, it's... It, was became uh, known after the war that Kuno actually had a personal letter from the emperor himself asking, you know, this is kind of strange, but asking for Americans to, 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 to not go to war because he was against it and that he will do his utmost to, to prevent this war, but that he needed Americans, under, understanding of the Americans and their help. Uh, this fell through because uh, Cordell Hull and Stissett, you know, Roosevelt, you don't want to go all the way to Alaska. For a meeting that be fruitless, he says, why don't we have the Japanese tell us beforehand what they're willing to bring to the table and what uh, they will agree to? Kone can't do this because he can't say, I have a letter from the emperor, because he knows the army will find out. And so, so it was really unfortunate that the summit did not take place. It, it, the, the, the course of events could have taken an altogether different path. And considering the counterfactual, I think this is really important because it shows you the 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 magnitude of, of Togo's final decision to stand up and rise. Uh, what happened if Togo had not read the most of it? What did he, you know, he had no access. He didn't have access to the decrypts. Well, I believe he would surely have resigned since he realized that he was the final card in preventing this war. Now, the imperial household would not have allowed uh, the appointment of a hawkish replacement uh, because, I mean, it would be a cabinet that was formed to go to war. And that would make the imperial household, the emperor, complicit to this. And so they probably would have said, okay, no, ask Togo to not quit, you know, convince him to come back, something of that nature, but not allow an appointment of a, a hawk foreign minister. The problem is, is that I've been talking today on diplomatic time, but there was also the military time the Japanese combined fleet has already uh, left Hitokapu in the Kuriles and is sailing to the northern Pacific. Uh, it's just, you know, just a few hundred miles uh, north of Hawaii. This is a different set of time. What is uh, Admiral uh, Yamamoto going to do? Is he going to anchor his ships until the Japanese uh, uh, government can figure out who the foreign minister will be? No, I think that he will lose his window uh, opportunity to attack, that he's not going to risk his Navy, uh, his, his, you know, his proud uh, Imperial fleet, he's going to have the ships come back. You know, and then a week later from Pearl Harbor, what happens in the Eastern Front is that the Soviets push back the Germans 100 miles. You know, and what becomes clear is that Germany is not going to win this war with the Russians very easily, which would allow Japan to reassess its situation and perhaps sit out this war, much like Spain did. So it's it's the diplomatic time versus military time. Uh, you know, look, this is something that most people don't know, but you know, the the Navy had another uh, set of plans, and uh, what was actually implemented was climb out Nitaka, which in Japanese is Nitakayama Nobore. But uh, the other one was okay. The U.S. Japan negotiations are making headways. Let's call off the attack. And that was Scuba Yamahare. Uh, the weather is fine on Mount Scuba. So there was the possibility that Japan, you know, could have avoided this war. Then they would have said, okay, the weather is fine on Scuba, Mount Scuba, send back the ships. Uh, but I believe the Rubicon was crossed when Foreign Minister Togo misconstrued, Ameri misconstrued American intentions. Uh, in today's world, I think there are a lot of similarities. Um, Japan, Germany, and Italy combined their uh, strength 
to establish a new world order, which meant challenging uh, the then uh, Anglo-US uh, uh, tax. Today, the challengers are China, uh, Russia, and Iran, with a few other countries that are unhappy with the current existing order too. It's been made very clear that they want to change the existing order. The rhetoric that's used by these leaders really resonate with the rhetoric used by uh, the Axis powers in the late 1930s. Uh, uh, are we uh, towards the end of the so-called interwar period? Are we heading towards another major war? You know, the, the purpose of this talk is not to discuss that, but to, to keep in mind that, that when a crisis situation takes place, that there are a lot of pitfalls. And one of the pitfalls can be uh, intelligence in that we try to, in our attempt to uh, try to avoid a major war, uh, that we misconstrue the intentions of the other side. And so I think uh, uh, lots of caution is warranted. And I think history can always serve as sort of a guide to, to where we're heading and, and, and the lessons that we need to be careful of. Thank you very much. And this is just to honor my uh, my mentor. He uh, he passed away uh, early uh, in the month. Uh, is a a great great man uh, with a person I know with heart of gold. Uh, so I'd like to dedicate, if I may, this, this talk to uh, the late Professor Makoto Yokibe, who was a great mentor to me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tosh, for a a very detailed and uh, interesting presentation on I think a. Uh, history that Americans obviously don't know very well. And as you said, doesn't really quite fit uh, with the rest of the book, which is on the Japanese American uh, experience. Um, we don't have a lot of time for questions. So there's, there's questions I could ask on the book questions I can ask you. Let me, let me start um, with the end where you, you talk about the difference between military time and diplomatic time. And it seems that there, there, there may be a third time in there as well, which is political time, which yeah, is, yeah. is the, the level where the decisions were being made at the cabinet on the Imperial War Council. Um, would the, Does that supersede both military and diplomatic time? Meaning, you you know, your your argument, it's a lot of inside baseball that Americans won't be familiar with, but if yeah, yeah. Togo had resigned, then your argument is that the the attack could not have gone forward because it would have ground the, the politics. Sure, sure, sure. End. Yeah. Um, which seems to be uh, opposite uh, or, or at least a uh, counter to, let's say, the Tuckman thesis that once you get the wheels turning, and as you said, uh, that the task force was already in, in the ocean, it's already in the Pacific, you know, that, that things then take on a life of their own. So how do you... How do you uh, respond maybe to someone saying, well, but if the fleet had been launched, they're, they're, they were going to do it at some point, or the politics could not have held. I mean, you, you, the, the, the normal operating of politics might not have held in such a crisis situation. So the end result being we would have had war anyway. How, how do those factor into how you think about this? Well, you know, I think with... Uh... In Japan's case, it's really different than, uh, for example, uh, the United States or Germany or, you know, the Soviet Union back then, because you just really do not have this strong political decision-making figure. I mean, the emperor could not be directly involved because he couldn't be re re responsible for anything. Uh, Prime Minister was, you know, General Tojo. Uh, he could control, he can rein in on the imperial army, but that was pretty much it. Again, it's, it's, it's going back to the competing institutions. When you have competing institutions at this level, I think the, the political aspect is relegated uh, to perhaps a, a lower tier. And, and and the focus becomes really on, on well, the military time you can't disregard uh, because the fleets are actually out there. And in the diplomatic, because uh, you have the diplomatic time because you have to resolve the situation with the United States. Well, the thing that I did not talk about because it would open up another a whole can of worms uh, is that the Imperial Japanese Army was a completely different animal. Uh, the Navy had a plan to actually call off the attack in return. Now, believe it or not, the Imperial Japanese Army, uh, <laughs> because it had never supposedly lost a major war, 
uh, did not traditionally have a plan to withdraw. So as you know, Japan's attack uh, on the Pacific War was two-pronged. The Navy would attack the United States, the Army would go into Southeast Asia, and it was actually uh, the Malay Peninsula. Japan Army invaded Malaysia, would later take Singapore. There was no plan to call this off. There was no, you know, Tsukubaya Mahare. So what would have happened is that the army would have proceeded to invade Southeast Asia despite the Navy calling off the attack. And this is where we go into the, to the conjecture. Well, then what would happen? You know, would the, how would the United States respond? Well, in my study of American uh, foreign policy during this time is, is that the red line was the Philippines. The United States would not go to war over Japan's invasion of Malaysia. That was a British thing. Uh, as proof, uh, when the British asked uh, the Americans to station troops to Singapore, the United States declined because it would be a tripwire. So I think it would have been a, a really strange situation in which you have Japan fighting a war in Southeast Asia, but not the United States. But again, this is all, you know, it's a history that did not transpire. So I mean, we could argue about it all day, but uh, to show you the difference that existed in Japanese institutions. And something you talk about in the chapter, which you uh, didn't uh, get to talk about uh, much here, uh, is the uh, the decoding. I mean, you started off a little bit with that. Can you just tell us a little bit more about that? Because obviously in the, in the, the histories uh, yeah, of yeah. the war on the American side and the British, you know, magic and purple, they, they all sure, play sure. Yeah. enigma. They play huge roles. Nobody thinks that the Japanese could actually do decryption. Absolutely. And that's, um, that's a very good question. And it's because there are, you know, different biases that uh, that that existed back then. And one is that, uh, well, it goes back to Pearl Harbor, how that Japan could never pull that off. You know, I mean, these, you know, Japanese are, are in, uh, genetically in fear in eyesight. They couldn't fly planes, you know, and that really uh, had an impact. And this perhaps goes into the book about how the Japanese Americans suffered the, these, these various prejudices. Um, but the basic assumption, uh, both the, the British and American intelligence sources, that the Japanese were not bright enough to be able to decrypt. And uh, even a report that was written in 1944, it writes that the Japanese, uh, because they were so incapable, had to ask Germany for help. And, and Germany initially helped the Japanese, but because the Japanese had nothing to offer in return, this cooperation was called off, which was really not true because the Japanese had been reading decrypts much earlier. Uh, from what I can see, you know, this all took place in the 1920s. Uh, and Japan, admittedly, was, uh, you know, uh, a late, uh, you know, was a late starter when it came to decrypts because Japan was not a major participant in World War One. And World War One is the major, major battle in which people would communicate via air, right? It was the radios and whatnot, which meant that anybody could receive it. So you had to protect it uh, rather than the landlines. Um, but so but Japan realized that in 19 after the war quickly convene a meeting uh, to, to sort of set up as a, a decrypting uh, unit. And surprisingly, it was Poland that offered uh, help. It was a, a Colonel uh, Kowalewski uh, who, who was brilliant in, in, in math. Uh, he played a role in, in breaking Germany's enigma, even though the British get most of the credit for that. Uh, he actually worked out the formulations uh, that allowed the British Brits to do that. So, and why is the why are the Poles helping Japan? Well, it's because their mutual enemy is the Soviet Union. Now, it's interesting when Germany invades Poland and Japan has the the Axis Pact, then Japan becomes an indirect enemy to Poland. Yet the Polish continue the intelligence cooperation with the Japanese, uh, with uh, the caveat that they would not share uh, intelligence that related to the Allied powers. So anything that dealt with uh, Germany and especially the Soviet Union, this this uh, cooperation would continue. So it really shows you the intricacies uh, that took place uh, during you know uh, World War II. So this is not something that you uh, obviously cover in the chapter. It's not something you talked about. I don't know if it's something you've looked at, but you've raised this whole issue of. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. As you said, you had the Mark Twain quote, you know, things you think you know that turn out not to be so. You're yeah, talking yeah. about missed opportunities, misunderstandings, 
unmet and mismatched expectations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you flip to the end of the war? And if, if you can't, that's fine. We can ask something else. But can you flip to the end of the war? And is there in any way a similar dynamic at the end of the war to what you've identified in the beginning of the war in terms of all of this? You called it the fog of diplomacy. Yeah, is there a yeah. fog of diplomacy and a fog of politics at the end of the war that is just as interesting as what you've talked about at the beginning? No, yeah, no, absolutely. And this is where it gets very politically sensitive uh, because, um, you know, how the emperor is revered here in Japan. And I don't want to get in trouble here, but uh, uh, and the end of the war is quite different in the Japanese decision making process because the emperor plays a very decisive role. He says, this is it. We're going to end this war. And you have disgruntled generals, but I mean, they're not going to go up against the emperor. So to such to show such decisiveness, the question is, why couldn't you do that in 1941? And of course, the counter argument was, well, he didn't realize the war would turn out so badly. And in 1945, Japan's been, you know, it's been bombed every day. And so that you know, it was out of desperation that he had to act. And I understand that. But, but um, you know, he, the fact remains that, that he was the key person in ending the war. But I think that Japanese history would have turned out to be much more uh, happier <laughs> if he had been that decisive in 1941, that it could have completely changed. And then it goes back to Japan's security identity to this day. I am very frustrated. It's the reason why I launched my think tank is that, and you should probably share this too, is that the Japanese do really do not understand the importance of security. That Japan, the role that Japan needs to play in today's world. And and it's because it goes back to the war that 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 they lost the war and they believe that everything that deals with military is bad and it's this you know you know this remorse that's continued oh, into the new century which i think really has to change and one of the things that that i think that you probably would if you had a time for another question this would be it is that i mean the parallels you know i think history rhymes at times and the parallel now, now the the new challengers are russia and china in Iran and, and and the rhetoric is very similar. Uh, Japan's inroad was into the continent, you know, and that became a big point of contention between the United States and Japan. Now China's expanding the other way into the maritime realm, and it wants to change the status quo there. And so, is there a chance that uh, that there could be some kind of conflict as the United States does not want China to close the door in the Indo Pacific, just like you know, uh, the United States didn't want Japan to close uh, China from the rest of the world. So, I mean, there's parallels there. And then I, I would be wonder, delighted to hear your insight on that because I know you're you're an expert on that. So what do you think? Because well, I think this really is a key part of this book is that 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 my chapter, at least, to, to think about the implications of today. So, I mean, what do you think? Well, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I, I would, <laughs> I, I'd love to answer, but I I really would rather ask you one final question. because. Okay, really, got sure, sure. Okay, yeah. I, I, I shouldn't be the one asking questions. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it, it's, no, I, I appreciate it. And I think we, you know, we should find time to actually come back and, and, and talk. Yeah, okay, Maybe sure. Not under the book event auspices, but under other auspices to talk about this. But I actually did. I want understand, to up, yeah. You know, we only have a few minutes. And so I actually did want to pick up on, on, on your comments here on uh, the contemporary uh, point about Japan not accepting or, or understanding security. And actually someone who, who did try to work much on that was Professor Iokebe with who mm -hmm. was your mentor mm -hmm. and with whom I studied, of course. Yes, you well. did. Yes, you did. Yeah. And so I thought maybe we could finish up if you could take a few minutes, actually just talk a little bit about, about who he was, his legacy. I think one of the great... Um, shames we have uh, here in the States is that we're, we really don't know great Japanese professors and scholars. Mm, we haven't, mm. The work isn't translated as much, though some of his was, his, his book on diplomatic history, I think was it, where I may have a Japanese copy, but I certainly have a copy. Mm -hmm, mm. Uh, you know, unfortunately, much of the work isn't translated, which is why this book, The uh, Japanese American America on the Eve of the Pacific War is so important. But maybe you can talk a little bit about Iokibe you know, Sensei. Yes. Uh, just yes. Our feelings here. No, thank you for uh, the opportunity to talk about him. You know, of course, he was my mentor. He was the he's the reason why I became a, a scholar. Um, you know, I had other ambitions back when I was younger, and uh, he's the one who guided me to this path. Um, 
But the thing that I appreciate most about Professor Yokebe, I mean, we, we we disagreed on you know whole host of of issues. Um, but he was a person who really felt that U.S.-Japan relations was important that it was the core of J Japanese foreign policy. And I see this because, you know, in Japan, um, academics, you know, of his, of his age, you know, people in their 80s, generally tend to be anti-America. You know, the, the American Association for Japan for a long time used to be really anti-American Association for Japan. It's because they viewed America as, you know, the hegemon, you know, the preacher and whatnot. Uh, but to Professor Yokebe, that was irrelevant. He says, no, Japan needs the United States. And, you know, and then and, and he, because he examined the occupation, you realize what the United States did for Japan, that that this was an undertaking that history has never seen before, that you have a country that is helping to rebuild an established democracy in a defeated nation. This is a, And of course, America had their reason to do so. And, you know, there were altruistic parts, but also non-altruistic parts, you know, it was about American interests as well, but, but he understood that. And I remember um, when there when was anybody who would doubt this, like, I remember this dinner that we had with somebody who was very anti-United States and, and Professor Yokebe, you know, you know him, is very mild-mannered, actually became visibly upset. He says, I can't believe you do not understand why you spend relations important. And so for this, I mean, this is why I really respected him because he really realized what was at the core of Japan and what was important for Japan. And for him, it was definitely the United States. And, and this, I think, was very unusual for somebody, you know, born in, in the early 1940s to, to feel that way. He didn't have any resentment. Uh, and, and he actually, you know, and, and he felt it wasn't that, that um, you know, of course, he regretted Japan's path to war and especially what Japan did in Asia. But it, it was, you know, he actually was not just looking in the past, he was looking in the future. And he but realized he also, that, yeah, go ahead. I was, I was just going to say, just at, at that point, the, the, the point mm -hmm. about looking towards the future, he also wasn't just an academic. Maybe you can talk about yes, that. Yes, yes. He was actually, he was the president of the National Defense Academy, uh, which was, you know, Japan's West Point, Annapolis, Air Force Academy, all rolled into one. Uh, and then they also, because uh, when I was a graduate student in 1995, that's when Kobe suffered that massive earthquake. Uh, first of all, you realized that, that you know, uh, recovery from disaster was also really important because in 1995, the socialist government it really thought it was Kobe's thing to deal with and that the government really didn't have much role to play. And he felt that was inc incredibly wrong. He felt that it was responsibility of the government. And so when the 2011 uh, Eastern Japan uh, earthquake and tsunami hit, I mean, he was you know, the chairperson uh, for the Committee of Recovery. And he actually moved the Japanese government to play a more active role in, in recovering from the disaster. So, yes, he was more than academic. Uh, he, he understood uh, security issues and he also, uh, you know, understood uh, the importance of disaster recovery. So yes, he wore many different hats. And, and it's really, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a big loss for Japan. I mean, you know, uh, I wish he, he would have been around for another decade because because of what's happening in the world today with, with you know, Ukraine and the Middle East, that and he could have been a really important voice to sort of point the correct direction for Japan. And the fact that he's not around, and I guess it means that we need to sort of play that role now. That's right. And, and I think that when you, you think about mm -hmm. Japan today, I talk about this a lot here in mm -hmm. Washington. It's a completely different Japan from 1991, oh, yeah. 1995, yeah. 2001. Yeah. And, it, and it has been a progression, but yeah. Uh, yeah. He played, uh, Professor Yokibe played a not insignificant role yes. in helping yeah. bring that new sense of Japan's mm -hmm. role in the world, mm -hmm. the one that you said still needs to be further developed, sure, which sure. is true. Absolutely. He played a big role in that. And so I think that's a nice way for yeah. us to... But you, you would agree it's a work in progress, right? That that Japan should be content. It shouldn't pat itself on the back. There's still more to do. <laughs> it's always it's always a work in progress. Uh, yeah. Until until end days, it's a work in progress. So <laughs> we, uh, I think we're pretty much out of time. Um, uh, it's, it's a fascinating chapter. In the book, again, it's a Hoover Institution press book, J J Japanese America, I was going to say Japanese Americans, Japanese America on the eve of the Pacific War. Again, most of the chapters are focused on the 
still relatively unstudied experience of Japanese Americans. Um, your chapter is this this fascinating diplomatic history uh, with with some intelligence skullduggery going on and and a lot of what ifs and and so I commend it to anyone who, who is trying to figure out how did we get to December seventh, nineteen forty one. Um, but the rest of the book also is is uh, is just a fascinating look at something that should be better understood. Uh, so Toshmi Nohara, professor at Kobe University, an old friend, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, and again, I'm Michael Oslin for the Hoover Book Club. Thank you for the opportunity.